Welcome, residents, to the Dr. DC Podcast. My name is Producer Richard, and next to me is the doctor himself. Hello. Each week, we talk about the weird and wonderful world of DC while fielding questions from listeners like you. Today, we are joined by host of It's Always Funny, Jordan Jesse Go, podcast writer for shows such as At Midnight, Unikitty, and creator of soon-to-be podcast turned movie, Bubble. Jordan Morris. Hey guys, happy to, happy to be here to talk about the nobility of the almost human porpoise. <laughs> <laughs> My I'm so, favorite topic. I'm so glad you brought that up. I made a note of that as like one of the best lines of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> this, that's one of the best lines in movies. <laughs> Not just this movie, but all of movies. Exactly. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, we're... we're, we're if you know if you're listening to the title of the episode, we are going to be talking about the that 60s Batman movie, classic Adam West Batman. But just before we get into that, uh, Jordan, are you are you like a, a, a big comic fan? Do you have a history with maybe this Batman series or anything like, like that? Yeah, uh, so I read a lot of comics. I did as a kid. I still read a lot of comics to this day. I think my uh, Zoom microphone is currently... Uh, on top of a stack of comics, so <laughs> awesome. um, they're they're in the house. Um, yeah, and and I uh, I am a big Batman guy, um, but I loved the Adam West Batman as a kid. I think you know when the uh, Tim Burton Batman came into theaters, uh, these reruns started uh, right. popping up on TV, kind of like after school around the time that. You know, Saved by the Bell would air. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, 4, 4.30, you'd get a Batman rerun. And I really loved it as a kid. I think I, I kind of went through the phases with it, you know, when I was a kid. I was like, oh, this is a show about Batman. And then, you know, when I was a teenager, I'm like, oh, man, that show was so corny and it sucked. And then I realized, <laughs> yeah. oh, shit, they were doing some next level tone shit on purpose yeah and this was actually a brilliant comedy that worked on a ton of different levels yeah absolutely so i mean you say you say you're uh you're a batman guy are there any other sort of like who's who's your favorite uh superhero maybe like next to batman is is it are you a dc guy do you read lots of marvel like i know we have lots of guests x-men comes up a lot actually yeah yeah yeah, boy, I think if you're a if you're in your, you know, the late 30s early 40s, like those Chris Claremont X-Men yeah. comics were huge. It went with the cartoon, it went with the trading cards. Yeah. Um, uh, the video games, you know, there was that great X-Men uh, stand-up arcade game. So, you know, it was kind of like... <laughs> yeah, that's I don't, right. I don't know. No, I, don't, the, all, I, don't, I don't have the gum. All yeah. the merch, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I was a Marvel kid. I uh, Spider-Man was my favorite, kind of, of X-Men, close second. Um, and yeah, and I read some DC. I read Batman. I remember like lining up at the comic shop to get the death of Superman. Um, right. Because I thought it was going to be worth a lot of money someday. <laughs> And that kind of opening up a weird world of like, oh, because, you know, if you read that, you know, collection, it is so seeped in DC continuity junk. Like, yeah. you know, it's not a story that you can comprehend just <laughs> from picking it up. Like, there's so much in it. So that kind of like opened my eyes. I'm like, oh, wow, DC Comics, they have a whole thing going on. Um, yeah. So like when I was a kid, it was, it was mostly Marvel, some DC, and then... You know, I kind of took a break from comics like in high school because I was embarrassed. Sure. Uh, you know, it, they had not kind of come back around as, you know, uh, kind of geeky pop culture cool or, you know. Uh, so, yeah. So that could, in college, you know, I, I kind of got into your 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 serious issue comics, your ghost worlds, your mouses, right. your fun homes. And... Um, and yeah, kind of from there, I kind of rediscovered superhero comics. Um, uh, I think that like the first thing I picked up after my hiatus was the Joss Whedon Astonishing X Men. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and then uh, and then you know, as as a comics adult, um, a, a big thing for me in my uh, current comics reading uh, was the uh, the books that Glenn Weldon wrote about. DC characters. Right. Uh, there's one about Batman and one about Superman. And uh, boy, yeah, if you guys haven't had Glenn Walton on on that's uh, this thing, you, uh, you you really should do it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so he wrote these kind of great, you know, uh, looks at the history of those characters. 
And uh, yeah, that kind of got me back into thinking about DC. Uh, so yeah, now I uh, now I, I read a little bit of everything. Yeah, I mean, before we dive into this, the the original Batman movie, this this uh, one from nineteen sixty six. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, before we dive into that, do you do you have like a, a, a favorite film incarnation of Batman since this one, uh, or you know, is it are you Keaton? Ben Affleck, like who? Who's your guy? Who's your who's your boy? Batman? You know, I uh, yeah. Let's see. This will either be very interesting or not interesting. <laughs> I, it's Army Hammer. It'll be there. one of the two. Army it's Army, Army Hammer. Hammer. That's <laughs> right. Big Army Hammer. Yeah, uh, Robert Pattinson. He's already my guy. <laughs> we haven't seen the movie yet, but I'm already all in on Pattinson. <laughs> Uh no, you know I like the Keaton ones. They're they're funny and weird. Um, uh, I thought that the Nolan Bale ones were you know totally cool and definitely yeah. like you know kicked off uh, comic book movies as we know them. Mm-hmm. I like the Snyder ones. I think the Snyder DC movies are pretty good and get a little bit of a bad rap in. Uh, in nerd circles, mm-hmm. um, you know, that love the Marvel movies. And I like the Marvel movies a lot too, but yeah. I think yeah. that uh, people who like hate the Snyder ones, um, you know, kind of want them, maybe are mad at them because they're not uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, <laughs> right. So yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, that, that Snyder is doing a cool version of them and and that they are definitely not for everybody and mm-hmm. you know I, I i respect not wanting to watch them but uh but i think they're they're kind of cool and have some cool stuff going on that um you know maybe maybe people pile on a little too hard yeah i think and i think affleck's good i think affleck's a good choice yeah exactly we've been doing this podcast for almost three years and it's taken until now to have someone that like kind of agrees with how i feel about <laughs> those movies <laughs> oh okay are you a, are you a snyder cut guy I, do, you, do you know what? There was a part of me that wanted to see it just for the sake of like, well, what did he have planned? But the people yeah, yeah. that are the Snyder Cut people have completely ruined it for me. <laughs> like, Sure. Now I, I sort I of know. hope it, it never it, sees the light of day. But there is a, there was a part of me <laughs> at first that artistically curious about where it might have gone. But Yeah, I, I think that Justice League movie is kind of cool. It's definitely kind of a, a, a mess because it was chopped up and edited by two different directors, but yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of neat stuff in it and cool action. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's a cool movie that I think kind of gets a bad rap. I, yeah. I think it's some of the best characterization. I think that like the, the like people who played the characters did a really, really good job. I just think mm-hmm. that, like the filmmaking doesn't not necessarily meet up to where it should be, but it's certainly not like open to everyone. I would say it like, like stylistically, it's going to turn some people away. Much and, like the, co- yeah. much like the Snyder cut people is not open to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's Snyder loves loves comics. He loves superheroes mm-hmm. and it comes across in the filmmaking and I think sometimes you see a comic book movie and it's like, oh, this person doesn't really care about the character. They're just, you know, you know, and they're doing a version of it that's like, you know, the comics are kind of dumb, haha, but this, you know. <laughs> right. Uh but I think Snyder definitely for better or for worse loves them uh and and kind of believes in that idea of of um you know superheroes as the modern myth and i think yeah. that 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 discussion gets a little eye rolly sometimes but i i appreciate that like he really believes it and uh thinks that it's important uh yeah yeah and and i and i yeah and i i like thinking about superheroes in that serious way too you mm-hmm. know just as right as 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 myth and as you know uh uh uh, you know something that you know the culture locks into for a some for some reason um so yeah so i i appreciate that side of it and i appreciate the earnestness of it yeah well let's uh let's, let's go to the polar opposite let's of let's switch gears from operatic to full farce yes. uh, uh-huh. right yeah uh so <laughs> we we all rewatched the uh the batman movie from 1966 i assume jordan this wasn't your first time watching it was it it was. It totally was. I, really? so I watched the TV show as a kid, and I knew the movie existed. Um, 
Yeah, and I think I had seen bits and pieces. You know, I mean, it's 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 very gifable, very YouTubeable. Yeah. You know, so I knew about shark repellent. Uh, some days you just can't get rid of a bum. Yeah. Some days you can't get rid of a bum. Oh, so <laughs> funny. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think it is something that I had seen in clips, but I had never, I had never uh, seen the whole thing. And right. God, what a treat! What a goddamn <laughs> delicious treat this thing was. Let's just get, let's just get right into it. What, what, what are some, of, some of your, your, your thoughts here? Uh, yeah, I mean, just very funny, great gags, great jokes, and I and I think that you know, uh, this is such a misunderstood series, uh, and I think that like, yeah, that that you know that it was, you know, that it was lazy or that it was bad or that it was you know, it was corny without knowing that it was being corny but man it is so funny it yeah and just and and everyone's so good in it everyone's great adam west is so funny just mm-hmm. and even in the little things there's this moment where he's staring off into the distance while opera plays where yeah. um, he, he he realizes that that the woman he was falling in love with the russian diplomat was actually catwoman in disguise that's right and he looks off into the middle distance while opera plays in his head. And it is, it's so funny. It's so it's, funny. It's, it's so serious. It's a longer and shot like, than anything in 1917. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. So the um, basic premise for people that may not have seen this, this movie. So we're taking the Adam West Batman, Burt Ward Robin, and they go up against four of their greatest villains. Uh, the Joker, played by Cesar Romero. The Riddler, played by Frank Gorshin. Catwoman, played by Lee Merriweather. And the Penguin, played by uh, Burgess Meredith. Uh, and the plot basically is that the villains have stolen this like instant dehydrating machine and they plan to dehydrate members of essentially the UN Security Council, the World yeah, Security and put them, Council. And put them into little vials. Yeah, they put them into little vials and they're going to hold them hostage for billions of dollars, basically. A bi- a bi- one billion dollars each. Yes. Yeah. Um, the 60s, that's a lot of money. That's. That's the basic premise of this movie. But there are so many other things that happen. Like, the movie opens with the famous, as you mentioned it, the shark scene where uh, Batman's flying over the, the bay in a helicopter and he goes down on a ladder. And the a water shark, goes into the water. The <laughs> shark is has a very fake shark is biting his leg and he's punching it. Just, But it's like not a shark sound. I mean, not that I would know what a punching a shark sounds like, but I don't think it's the... Oh, <laughs> That's a funny critique. Yeah. It's the Foley word. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see actually when he when he comes up and the shark's on his leg, like water is is shooting out of it because it's full of holes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like not airtight. I know. Just the cheapness of the props is so funny. And you know, it, 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 I don't think it matters if it was all the money they had or if it was a deliberate choice. It's yeah. so funny. It's so, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So I think like, it does not matter the intent. It's just great. It um, yeah. So like he's got the shark on his foot. It feels like something that they would nowadays try to like make, like they, like that's a movie that would come out now trying to make fun of like old time movies. Like, R- right. It's such a modernistic sort of look into it. And which is why I don't think people got it for so long is because it's like, it's way beyond the comedy that they were doing at that time. You know? I mean, even just the moment where he calls to Robin and says, I need the shark repellent bat spray. And Robin has to go to like the rack and there's manta ray repellent bat spray. Like, yeah. There's like different whale types. Whale repellent whale bat repellent. spray. It's not just that they have a shark one. It's that he has to pick it out of the, like all of these <laughs> other ones. Yeah, it's just so many great visual gags. It really reminded me of Naked Gun in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like Naked Gun, an airplane. It seemed like it is more that, you know, it is more airplane than it is, you know, uh, uh, the Christopher Reeve Superman, you know? Yeah. I think part of why it maybe gets it, it gets such a, like a, a confused rap or whatever is because they play it more straight than than those movies ever did. Yeah. Like, right. they play it so seriously. And I, I can't tell... I sometimes can't tell how much of it is Adam West just being a great actor or how much of it is maybe just like, if I play this really seriously, people will think I'm a great actor. <laughs> right. I, I can't tell where that line is, but it comes across. It's, it's so funny. So, so, so good. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about some, some um, moments that we, we love in, in this one. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, like right away, the like, it, it, I find it so funny the way that they sort of like the it, right right away. It's like they're inside this car. They get they get out of the car, and so they can get into their costumes. So they can get into the Batmobile, so they can go to the Batmobile to the Batcopter. Right. They can take the Batcopter and then use the Bat. Like there was, there's so many steps to get like that. That first sort of yeah. like scene in itself, I think, is so funny that like I I couldn't get over the like the the amount of extra details needed to be put in. But I also don't understand the like the 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 instant cha- close change lever that's one of the things that i was trying to figure out for like 10 right. minutes i was like were they going down they go down the poles they switch the thing and suddenly they're in their clothes but i don't know yeah. what what has to happen for that mechanism to work oh i think i think that's the first time you ever see that lever though like the movies i think maybe commenting on a detail they never like they just glossed over in the show, which is oh. they go down yeah, the pole one way. Yeah, because in the show, right? It, it, yeah, right. They go down the pole, and as soon as they're at the bottom, the outfit's on. But yeah. I think the movie is revealing to us that there's actually a lever that they're hitting midway down that puts on their costumes, which, they... which which is an incredible joke because they're saying you wanted to know how they do it. This is how they this do it, but lever. it doesn't. There's explain a lever, anything. and it is funny that the lever calls it a costume. Yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It is almost kind of like, you know, it does almost have a school play quality to it. Or a, let's yeah. put on a show, gang. Like a, It is like, it has a community theater type vibe that is just, it's just great. It's like, it, it is always acknowledging that it's a show. Yeah. Well, and to your point about the getting from one vehicle to another, I think that's really where you see the budget of this movie is the vehicles. Because there's also yeah. the back boat. Bat copter, like you said, there's also the bat cycle. We're like we're going through as many vehicles as we can. We're it's like the full arsenal of the bat cave is in this movie. Yeah, and it feels like that did <laughs> that idea of just like, oh, let's see all Batman's vehicles, like that made its way into other Batman movies. Yeah. There are gratuitous <laughs> this ridiculous gratuitous thing. Batman vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's totally true. I, I do love that. That's one of the things that's so interesting is when you look back at this, like how much still got brought in from this ridiculous thing mm-hmm. into all of the serious things that sort of preceded. Like I've got to say, I think my one of my favorite like pieces of this movie, because the four villains are working together, you see little bits of each of their personalities. But I think the one, maybe the most underplayed villain in this movie is Frank Gorshin's Riddler, who was huge on the show. Yeah. He does relatively little in this movie, but <laughs> among his riddles are like, uh, what weighs six ounces and is very dangerous, and it's a sparrow with a machine gun. And he right, goes, of, yeah. of course. Or like, what's yellow and can write? I go, a ballpoint a, banana. A ballpoint of course, banana. the only logical <laughs> explanation. <laughs> Yeah, I love I love the dumb logic to figure out the riddles. Like he he's trying to figure out who's behind it, and he's like, "The shark came from the sea, sea, Catwoman," yeah. and everyone yeah. in the room nods, <laughs> there's, like you figured it out. Well, and then like later in the same scene, he goes, "The shark was literally pulling my leg." The Joker, <laughs> right? Yes. yes. It's that. true. It's true. <laughs> yeah. It, the the movie's so chock full of like those kind of gags. Do you do you have a couple that really stand out as like like peak moments from this movie? Yeah, I mean, I I like I like all the little nods to it kind of being a kids movie and I think right. that's something they kind of had fun with. It, it is maybe like it kind of has a Pee-wee's Playhouse thing going on where it's for kids but you know, also adults are supposed to enjoy it too. Like right. I, I love when he goes over to the Russian diplomat's apartment uh, uh, to, to, to get it on. Yeah. And she's like, I'll slip into something more comfortable while your cocoa is warming. <laughs> so I love that Bruce Wayne goes up to her apartment for yeah. hot cocoa. Um, and there's a, there's a weird little thing when they go to the seedy neighborhood where he tells Robin, like, Oh, criminals can operate here because everyone is, you know, <laughs> everyone's mind has been made too hazy by alcohol. And Robin's like, alcohol, why would anyone ever drink that? Oh, There's yeah. this kind of like ham-fisted moralizing that you could tell they don't believe in, but it's kind of in there as a as a joke about moralizing. 
Yeah, like Robin is um, Robin is saying, like, how did nobody notice four costume villains here? And yeah, Batman says right. something to the effect of like, it's drunken hallucinations. They can't tell what's real anymore. <laughs> right. Too many all these drunks. <laughs> yeah. Um and yeah, there's a part where Batman explains to Robin why they can't tamper with the uh, diplomat's DNA. Oh, right. And Robin says, Gosh, yes, Batman. <laughs> Just like true. gosh yes is such a funny thing because he's a like, Robin's supposed to be a kid and I don't I don't know there's that stuff is really fun I like the um, detail that he makes uh, Alfred drive the Batmobile to tail him while he's Bruce Wayne because uh, Robin is too young to drive yeah that is good so and yeah and, and, Ward. well Bert, yeah Bert Ward clearly is... twenty five or twenty six in this movie. <laughs> They really try to put an emphasis on, like, they always say, like, his youth ward. I'm like, yeah. you're really putting some right. stank on youth. Commissioner <laughs> Gordon answers the phone and says, hello, boy wonder. Yeah. <laughs> <He> goes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I love how every how excited everyone is to get a call from Batman. That always made me laugh. When, yeah. You know, Batman would call the various, um, you know, police people or, you know, departments. And he's like, this is Batman. And there's a secretary who goes like, oh, hello, Batman. <laughs> Just to me, that is so... <laughs> Just being excited to get a call from Batman. I would be excited. It's yeah. Fun. Well, because this Batman is like a civil servant. He's a he's a quote unquote fully deputized member of law enforcement. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like when they're driving in the Batmobile, Robin calls ahead to the airport and says, "Get the bat copter ready." Like they're not taking off from Wayne no. Manor. <laughs> they they're yeah, going the to the airport. airport stirs, stores the bat. Yeah. yeah every, like the the community loves him, and they're just there to like help Batman in any way they can. Yeah. Exactly. He gets pissed when they call him a vi- the cops get pissed when they call him a vigilante yeah yeah they're like he is not a vigilante he is yeah. a deputized like yeah. member of this he's just a force. he's just a cop who we don't know who he is yeah <laughs> i gotta i gotta say because you brought it up with the scene with the diplomat i i've mentioned this to richard before we started recording but i was a little bit surprised at how horny this movie is because i do not remember yeah, it it's being pretty that horny way. I mean, it's definitely like PG horny, you know, like yeah. it's it, it is it, like. But it's in there. There's some like there are some looks. There's like a there's a lot oh, yeah. of like, you know, that sort of like, quote unquote, accidental contact where it's like, oh, they th- the Riddler threw me, but I landed right in your breasts. Like there's a lot of that kind of stuff in this movie. Yeah, so there's the little part of it is a romance between him and Catwoman. He thinks she's a Russian diplomat, right. but it's really Catwoman in disguise. And yeah, you get to see a whole kind of kind of uh, extended scene where you know Bruce Wayne, looking great in a tuxedo, looks amazing. Uh, oh, yeah. Takes her takes her out on the town, and yeah, I mean, Lee Merriweather looks great, by the way. I yeah, mean, just a just a, a '60s babe if there ever was one. Um, yeah, I don't know, and it is like it is kind of hot, and there's a lot of like innuendo, <laughs> and there's also a part of it where on this date, Robin and Alfred, Alfred who has a mask, Alfred who drives the bat will be while wearing yep. a little mask, still wearing his um, suit, but just puts a domino mask on. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, they're following them in the Batmobile and like watching, you know, through a closed circuit bat TV. And when things look like they're getting intimate, Robin turns turns it off to give <laughs> Batman his privacy. <laughs> yeah. But there's a fun kind of voyeuristic like, ooh, it would be very naughty of us to look in on Master Wayne when he's well, with his, you know, kind his of a lady friend. Where, there's kind of a moment where Alfred, I mean, Alfred is making a good point. But he goes, shouldn't we turn that back on? We're supposed to be watching him. And Robin goes, that, that's not decent. And Alfred goes, I guess not. He's, <laughs> there's like, yeah, that's not I know. There's old, this weird go, like horny, gonna... horny old Alfred. <laughs> You raised this. You raised him after his parents died. You don't yeah. <laughs> want to watch He's him earned fuck. This look. Um, why don't Why don't we talk a little bit about these villains? Because each of these actors is, or at least each of these characters, but also each of these actors is big in their own way. They cram four of them together, which seems to be like it's a model that modern movies have never cracked. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, I know. The multi-villain movies always always kind of fall apart. What are the examples? Spider-Man 3 can yes. handle all the villains. Yeah. Um, um I I would argue I would argue Dark Knight Rises, but um Batman and Robin. How dare oh, you? Oh yeah, sh- <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I I enjoyed this so much. It would be funny to go back and watch the Schumacher Batman, which I have a memory of not really liking that much, but maybe they're in this zone and maybe I would like them kind of in this 
in this lens. I definitely think Batman and Robin fits this sort of model more than Batman Forever. Because Batman Forever, like Justice League, is one of those ones that sort of started under one direction and then was handed off to someone else. So it's got a bit of that weird I mean, identity card, crisis. I mean, the... Well, oh, yeah. I mean, Batman and Robin is full of, like, cheesy puns. All of the villains have, like, hench people that clearly wear their uniform. Like, <laughs> like all that kind right. of stuff. Uh, yeah, I think it's pretty close. I, I gotta say, I'm always... I'm surprised how Penguin-centric this movie is. Burgess Meredith is, like, the villain. Cesar Romero's Joker is just, like, also there. Same with the Riddler. Uh, it's yeah. Catwoman and Penguin are, like, the big ones in this. Yeah, I, I will say, though, I, I always love how you can see Cesar Romero's mustache underneath <laughs> the clown paint. Uh, I guess the the 66 Batman Joker Funko Pop toy, you can see his little mustache. Yes, oh yeah. God, that's incredible. Yeah, I've seen that. Which that's is a great amazing. a great detail. I, like, I, I do not collect uh, Funkos, but I, part of me is like, ah, I need to track that one down. Yeah. <laughs> which yeah. is funny, because you used to think like it was that he just didn't care enough about the role to do that. But I think part of it is sort of the like comicality of like having it like having the fact that it's right there i think that it's i think it's a little bit of both because he's also like easy now i'm caesar romero i'm not shaving my mustache for yeah, this for this stupid <laughs> right. cartoon show yeah. yeah um yeah and 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 everybody's great and everybody gets to you know stretch well i guess catwoman and penguin both get to stretch a little bit she gets to play the russian diplomat and then mm-hmm. he he gets to do a very funny thing where he pretends to be a british sea captain <laughs> yes but he's bad at it and he's clearly the penguin yeah and to try they and take break him, into the bat cave basically yeah, yeah they take him yeah. back to the bat cave to like test to like scan his retinas or something <laughs> yeah. um so yeah you know they get to do little like characters doing characters which is a lot of fun I love that. I love that bit because he goes like, "Oh, pip pip." Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> <'Cause> like, <laughs> yeah, no, right. He's still. both. He's saying stereotypical British stuff, but right. He has to. He has to quack like a penguin. <laughs> what he like? It, a great bat gadget is they. They have to. You know, they spray him to make him unconscious, but they take him to the bat cave, and then, and then Adam West says, "I'm going to give him the bat wake now," and he sprays a different thing, a different aerosol. And he wakes up and instantly like, wah, 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 wah. and he goes, oh, 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 the Batcave, oh, cheerio. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, a lot of Batman's tech in this is aerosol based. There's a yes. lot of sprays. It's a lot of mists. It's a lot and, of spritzes. And same, with, same with Penguin. He's got like knockout gas in his umbrella when they storm like the, the world uh, nation's building. Oh, I mean, yeah, the sure. The 60s was like the advancement of like aerosol technology. I think. I mean, there's so much yeah. things based around aerosol. I mean, it, it probably is like the height of tech for that. It's also like the I think the lowest budget gadget you can make I mean, that's where it's true. like we will just right. color the gas. It'll come out. We'll do the scene. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it is like how every modern action movie these days has like a drone in it. Like, oh, yeah. they have to escape a drone. It's just because it's the most current technology. Then it's <laughs> yeah, like, oh, right. <laughs> look out. The bad guys all have aerosols. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any any other sort of highlight uh, highlight moments there? Oh, I mean, for me, it's it's all of the little tiny things that happen in between, like sort of the big set pieces where it's like the quiet conversations where you see like the little head tilt where you just go, wait, wait what? Like, right. Is that is that what they were referring to? Like, th- like, like having that scene where like where like right at. First of all, I didn't really understand what was happening with that boat because it's like the first scene is like on a boat. And I don't really know what they were right. doing there because you were thinking that the whole the intent of it was to get onto the boat. Right. But once the shark thing happens, they just immediately flash forward to like yeah. after what had ever happened on the boat yeah because the boat wasn't really there yeah it was a decoy uh like a, a mirage yeah, boat. that th- that thing is is maybe two ticks too complicated yeah but, yeah <laughs> and then it's just the police like pushing away like the press but i like i just love the idea of batman standing in the press is like like batman you have to answer a question he's like i don't want to do it. the police like get the hell away from batman <laughs> Yeah, it's Batman just a, has a a daily televised press conference. It seems. Yeah, yeah. 
it's so it's so different from like the bat like the police have to officially be like against batman sort of take that we have now it's right? so different but also just like the idea of batman in the daylight is also a thing that i always love about these is like right. you, batman is so synonymous with like he works in the dark like he's yeah. in the shadows and this whole thing is just like the most amount of light possible he's just driving on the street and he's he's parallel parking and then he goes into a yeah building. That that does seem like something that they thought was fun or funny is how can we have all the bat vehicles just on the freeway or, <laughs> you know, in in the harbor. And then yeah. there's a whole scene where they just run down the street in their uniforms and it looks like they just had them run out into traffic. It looks like yeah. they're just filming a city street uh, and with them running around. It's so great. Yeah, they decide that it's it would take too long by taxi to get to the world nations building well, so there's no back right. so they're so, so they're gonna run they're gonna get so and the reason they can't fly the bat copter there is one of my favorite bits hmm. which is the bat copter gets shot down like at the beginning of the third act of this movie yeah. and the riddler thinks that he's killed them and they're going down and they go like oh no this is it this is it and then crash they just unbuckled they get out and they've crash landed at the foam rubber wholesalers convention and they just yes. land on this big pile of foam rubber <laughs> and there's a sign next to it that says foam rubber in its crude form yeah <laughs> it's like the funniest sign joke in history um yeah that is that is really delightful god damn i love that oh so much. man um what what would if you had to, we mentioned a couple of things, but if you had to t say, like, what are like, what are the things that inadvertently we did learn from this movie in making future Batman projects? What would you say are like some of the like, the biggest, most influential pieces of '60s Batman? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think I, I think the like big lesson of this is that like these characters that have been around for a long time, you can do a lot of different stuff with. And, you know, like, I don't think this is any less of Batman than, you know, Batman V Superman is like, that is also Batman. And this is Batman. And yeah, I think it's just a great Testament to like, these characters are, have been around, you know, so long, like almost a hundred years now, like they've been around so long because they're great characters. Uh, and, you know, you can fuck around with them. You can fuck around with them in really fun ways. And, like, yeah, I don't know. I think it's a fun lesson in kind of not being too precious in, you know, what you think a character is or what you think a franchise is. Because, like, yeah, this is – yeah, because this is – this has as much right to be Batman as the Nolan stuff, as the Snyder stuff, you know. And it's and it's it's great. And it's all great stuff. And you may – you know, even though you – you know, prefer it one way or prefer it the other way doesn't mean that this is any less valid. And I think that's really cool. And I think because, you know, so much of like entertainment is reshuffling IP these days uh, for better or for worse. Um, yeah, I think it's nice to kind of remind oneself that like you can see a different version of something and and it can still be cool. And it's how you help things keep fresh, you know, and it's, you know, and it's... Uh, yeah, because I don't know. I think some of this big franchise stuff can all start to look so samey. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's just kind of fun to see a different version and it's fun to see like someone take a swing. Absolutely. I, it's, what's fun about this is that I think I think that for a lot of people, this was their first interaction with Batman, which yeah. is really interesting because it's a thing that I think works best when it's when it's like the 10th batman thing that you've encountered because i mean it, it it was able to exist after like 20 years of batman existing and that's sort of how they could play on the form but so many that that, that meant that those people had to have read the comic books to get why that it's funny what they're doing and i think that that it's now even funnier looking back on it because you know we've had we've had almost like a hundred years of batman to look on to then pull this out it's like all of these things that have been playing on for years it's like it, it makes it i think it makes it way funnier now than it ever was well and i mean the, the comics at least still play on some of the stuff i mean scott snyder is a writer who will like deliberately introduce there's i think it's an all-star batman in the, in that run where he makes a deliberate point to uh to show how all of bruce's toys are bat shaped 
Yes. Mm -hmm. He's got like a pair of like knucks that come out of his gauntlet and they're called bat knuckles. And they're like sort of bat shaped. Now in that comic, that's brutal because they're like sharp and pointy. Yeah. It's like really violent in that sort of Frank Miller way, but it's also very funny in this 60s Batman way. Yeah, I um I read the uh the mini series uh White Knight, I think yeah. by Sean yeah. Murphy, who I think yeah. both drew it and write it, wrote it both drew it and wrote it. Um and I think that's a great little Batman story and definitely at at the end um you know, kind of Batman and the kind of assembled Bat family, you know, Robin, Nightwing, Batgirl, they all get into different versions of the Batmobile to do this kind of raid on the enemy hideout. And, and yeah, and like the fucking 60s Batmobile is in there and the, uh, you know, and the fucking Nolan Bat tank is in there. I don't know. It's just a great little like moment of like, hey, like this all counts. This is all valid. Like it's all fun, uh, you know, and check out what a cool long history this thing has had. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we also got lots of questions yeah, yeah, from our about listeners it. about 60s Batman, partly about the movie, partly just about just the wider sort of uh, world. I hesitate to call I was going to call it cinematic universe. <laughs> like, that's yeah. not what they call no, it. That's not what this is. Yeah. But uh, yeah, why don't we get into it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, why, don't, why don't we go over to Facebook first? Okay, go to the face in the book. Go to the Facebook. Yeah, it's moments like this where we have guests that I actually respect uh, that makes these, the, these drops like embarrassing. <laughs> Wow. Take yeah. that, other guests. Yeah, fuck, <laughs> fuck those guests. <laughs> uh, just like this. Uh, first question comes from We've Only Just Dan Done. It's, it's a lot weirder when it's like I, like this long before we get into the questions <laughs> that the stupid shit starts coming out. You're doing great. Oh, yeah. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate Own it. Own it. Uh, Dan Dunn asks, uh, what do you think of Grant Morrison's idea that this version of Batman is the result of being gassed and drugged constantly by <laughs> Joker and others at the time? Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't heard that. Where does where does I mean that's God. That is a very Grant Morrison type uh, yes. type concept. Where does that come out? I, it doesn't ring a bell to me. I'm a, I actually I actually couldn't find when he said that. But I I there is something funny about that idea that like if you're I I have to imagine it's Morrison trying to fold as he often does fold continuities together, give them all a place to live in whatever's sure. currently going on. Yeah. And, like, the idea that, like, this whole thing is a crazy hallucination <laughs> is, like... Yeah, I mean, it's such an... I mean, the whole thing is so, like, so, like, dipped in 60s drug culture, you mm -hmm. know? It just feel like it's all a kind of, you know, dopey acid trip kind of thing in, in, a, in a great way. Uh, dope, by dopey, I mean um, made by people who have been smoking dope. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. I love the idea yeah. that, like, he's probably talking about it in terms of how silly the show is, but he's probably also imagining that Batman is literally seeing the words, like, pow and blam <laughs> and stuff like oh, that, like, yeah. in the real world. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Which I think is also pretty funny. That's, that's hilarious. There's a marked absence of those pow and blams yeah. in this movie until the final fight on the on the boat. Yeah, you got to save something for the last battle, you know. I, yeah. I kind of, I was, I was, I, I was noticing that they weren't there, and then when they came in, I was excited. Yeah, I, there's, a, there's a henchman with a comically large wrench, and he gets a thwack, I think. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. someone gets a sploosh when they fall into the water. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I was just Batman looking at Robin, but yeah. <laughs> um, all right, uh, let's go to the next question. Let's do it. Uh, we're leaving Facebook and heading on over to Twitter. Twitter. First question comes from Jeff Whaley. 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 Uh, who asks, rank your five favorite villains in this series. Yeah. So let's blow this up to like the full 60s Batman series. Who, who are your five favorite villains? Oh, boy. Uh, number one's Catwoman. Always, always uh, a special place in my heart. And I'm talking about all, all three Catwomen. Uh, with Lee Merriweather, uh, uh, Eartha Kitt, and mm -hmm. Julie Newmar. Were those the three Catwomen? Yeah, those were the three. Yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, all great in their own way. It's such a fun character. It's such a fun performance. Oh, God. How about, how about the fight on the submarine where Batman has to protect the cat the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, throws, really? he throws it in a little life raft. I do feel bad for the actual cat in that situation. He who, really saved the uh, cat in that moment. <laughs> Again, yeah, though. Yeah, there's the old, uh, again, though, the old screenwriting if, adage. If we're calling, I won't say it's deliberate, if we're calling back or forward to things, but there's a whole fight scene in that first Guillermo del, del, uh, del, del Toro, Toro yeah. Hellboy movie where he saves a box full of kittens while he's yeah, fighting a monster. Yeah. 
Oh, that's funny. That's um, awesome. Yeah, so Catwoman number one. Uh, yeah, Joker number two. Uh, Riddler number three. Penguin number four. And uh, let's say King Tut number five. King well, Tut. That's a good one. Great villain. I mean, it's really interesting that this show really brought the Riddler into sort of like commonplace because, I mean, that was a pretty lesser known villain prior to the show. I mean, and, and I mean, even nowadays is still like he's considered one of the big ones but like really when you look at him how often does he show up and also there's a lot of modern comics that deal with the idea that like maybe riddler's a one-trick pony and other villains don't respect him (laughs) which is like (laughs) that's a pretty big trope i like the uh the tom king riddler thing the war of jokes and riddles i thought that was great yeah and there's a good there's a good um there's a good Riddler. A couple years ago, they did like a, a year of villains thing where mm-hmm. like every villain got a one shot. Yep. There's a great Riddler one. Uh, I, I don't know who wrote it where he uh, spends, uh, he like has this whole elaborate plan to, I think, kill one of the guards at Arkham because he stopped him from completing a solitaire game. And it kind of just shows like, Riddler's is motivated oh, by OCD. Right. So that one, yeah, that's Am I remembering from, that right? That's from Forever Evil. Uh but that yeah, that was one of the tie-ins for that one. That is a very good okay. one. Okay. The, the yeah. Riddler tie-in for Year of the Villain is also kind of weird. It's Riddler and King Tut basically commiserating that they're jokes. <laughs> and he's he doesn't understand why Lex Luthor hasn't given him like an upgrade the way he has to other villains. It's like oh, a funny. whole thing about the Riddler like coming to terms with how he's perceived, which is sort of yeah. funny. But uh, maybe if you'd the, stop uh, fucking see, the hiding. Snyder's, uh, Snyder's Zero Year, I think, is the real, Riddler's the villain of that. That's a good, uh, yeah. that's a fun, uh, that's a fun Riddler story. Yeah. I think, I think because it's the Riddler, though, you just, I think those stories just need so much, there's so, such an, an added layer of thought you have to put into them to make him credibly a genius slash the Riddler. And I, I think maybe that, means that when there is a riddler story it's big and it's usually pretty good but then there'll be gaps between them because it's like i don't have the riddles in me right now i need to like (laughs) yeah it's a lot of a lot of writing involved in being that villain (laughs) i i just if i could never fucking find another like riddler question mark around gotham ever again i'd be pretty happy oh the arkham games yeah those trophies oh yeah yeah. damn trophies uh do you have five Favorite villains from the I mean, uh, Batman series. A lot of those ones definitely came up for me. Uh, Egghead definitely is Egghead. Vincent oh, Price. Egghead, yeah, yeah. got to put that guy up in there. I think that it's like your proto Lex Luthor. Like you get a lot of the similarities, but with like more ridiculousness. But <laughs> yeah, a very silly sort of Lex. Yeah, yeah. I, sure. I think that 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 comes up to me a lot. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of like intelligence based characters with this, and like a lot of people like the. It's there's not a lot of like uh, um, th- like action based heroes and like villains in this. That's true. Yeah, I think yeah, that, it's a lot about outsmarting or or pranks or traps or things like that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very rarely sort of um, like they have like abilities that you have to sort of outmatch or anything like that. So sure, I think a lot of the ones that Jordan already said for sure. Uh, is there anything that's popping out to you that's not? Um, so I, I think for me, I mean, I've always I've always loved the Eartha Kit Catwoman particularly. I mean, they're all great, but the, the yeah, some, she's so she's, good. It's Eartha Kit's voice, right? When when, when she yeah. says like perfect, yeah. it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Um uh I always liked Otto Preminger as Mr. Freeze. Now back then, <laughs> Mr. Freeze didn't have the tragic backstory uh thing about his wife. He was just a a cold guy with a freeze gun. So it's not they're not particularly in-depth stories, but I just I love the design of it. He had these big bushy orange eyebrows and his skin was blue and yeah, it was, I I like that Mr. Freeze. Uh, yeah, Egghead definitely up there. King Tut is funny. I kind of like the Mad Hatter. Oh yeah, from that series. Oh, I don't think I remember the '60s Mad he's, Hatter. He's a lot less, you know, like oh Alice, and you're late. Yeah. Like he's a lot less of that. But I don't know. There's something funny about him. He's got this big bushy mustache and. It's just hat themed crimes. There's just it's so silly. I, I kind of love him. He shows up a lot 
in the first season of that Batman show. What's a hat three themed crime? Oh, Are you they, stealing hats or using or, hats? Or it'd be like, oh, there's a crown on, uh, you know, on display at the museum okay. and he, it's the greatest hat of all. And he, yeah, like, sure. you know, he has to go get <laughs> it. I must have like that. that hat. Yeah. There's like They're a my lot thing. of stuff like that. Yeah. It's really a hat on a hat, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It sure, is, sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, um, I watched the pilot episode today uh, and it's, it made me laugh so hard because it's the, if the first villain is Riddler. Yes. Which is incredible. And the, the his big like like joke his big trap is the fact that he he gets Batman to break into a place that he already like owns and like steals it and like to help oh, him right he, he like beats him up for a thing that that like he's he's not even stealing it it's a thing he already owns so then he tricks Batman into coming in there beating him up uh, and basically then he sues him yes yeah <laughs> his big thing is just that he's gonna sue Batman for like assault and battery and, <laughs> yeah, that's and breaking right. and entering yeah it's like a PR nightmare for him it's yeah. the Fucking, that's the funniest goddamn thing to like hit the big this big thing is like that's a, that's a really good one. Uh, I really really love that that first episode's so funny. I love also when they're like they're they're trying to figure out how they're gonna solve the Riddler's puzzle, which also looked like some like temp like wrote down the riddle and then just threw it to them before they started filming <laughs> yeah. because like it's so poorly written and it, it like for some reason they capitalize Anne in the middle of the sentence like very weirdly <laughs> written uh, just like on some like scrap piece of paper that somebody found but then all the police are looking around going like well who's going to solve this and each police officer and they're going from like the top of the police force to the bottom and they're all like well, I don't want to do this like <laughs> do you know do you know who we we often uh, forget to mention, but he's a character that I think is missing in comics and modern interpretations. And I'm sort of saying this on behalf of my father, who feels very strongly about this. But Chief O'Hara, huge character in the show, oh, yeah. also in the movie, just the most stereotypical <laughs> Irish cop. And he's completely like his his role is to tell Gordon that it would be a good idea to call Batman. <laughs> That's right. what he does. I guess that's uh, yeah. Is, is that is that Bullock in the comics? They <laughs> they needed another cop who's not Commissioner Gordon to do something. But yeah, they both. I guess both Commissioner Gordon and Chief O'Hara like Batman. Yeah, they both Gordon, like Gordon him. Would I mean, everyone likes like, Batman. Exactly. Gordon would say something like, "Oh, these dastardly foes. We have to call Batman." And Chief O'Hara would be like, "Right, great idea." <laughs> and then that's it. <laughs> I was just about to say, "Call Batman." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it i just love that they all they it's the most cowardice filled like police precinct they like i think they, they They're, come, it's it's like the cops from demolition man yeah. from the future in demolition man yeah they have no they don't have no idea what to do other than call batman <laughs> exactly they, I, as if they were not going to do it they all just kind of like eye the red phone and be, be like, like Listen, we all know what's going to happen next. But I yeah. do love that the red phone is literally just to really call Alfred. Like, especially the first episode, yeah. they, they Alfred picks up and he goes, "I'll get him," and then he just hangs up the phone. <laughs> but also, we uh, like, learn in the movie that the red Batman phone is next to a black phone that calls <laughs> LBJ. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Oh it's God. funny that oh the commissioner of that's... Gotham can, like, just the, the guy from the city can just call the president at any point. That's really I lo- funny. I love that, with including the president in that movie, they, they obviously don't show him. You're seeing him from behind the chair, but there's also a cat on his desk, so the president looks like Blofeld. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's good um all right let's go to the next question let's do it uh comes from master gus 666 oh that's i mean that's that seems problematic um what are some of the lesser known villains from the series you would think would be fun in the matt reeves the batman so some of the ones that we mentioned what what's one that you want to see get like the modern treatment on film a, a, a king tut or an egghead or uh the archer or uh, like any of those kind of Oh God! Yeah, I mean, I think I mean we're getting Penguin in the movie, right? Isn't that? Uh, isn't I think it, we're getting uh, a lot of them. We're we're definitely getting Riddler. Okay, um, who's Riddler? Uh, Riddler is Paul Dano, I think. Yeah, it is. Oh, that's good. That's good yeah, casting. That's good casting. Uh, yeah, we're um, getting Penguin. You're right. We're getting Catwoman also in that. Jeez. Um, um, boy, yeah, this thing's gonna be a mess. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's. it's it's shooting for the moon the way the 60s Batman yeah. one did. Who knows? No, if they I know. Can pull Maybe it'll, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it'll be cool. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, I think Mad Hatter would be fun. Yeah. Um, does the, God, is the, 
is the ventriloquist guy in this, or was he an animated series only? Animated I don't. Series. I don't think ventriloquist ever yeah. made it to to this sixties Batman show. But yeah, I agree. I mean, if they did do the ventriloquist, it would have been extremely funny and silly on this show. But I would. I would definitely like to see a movie version of that. Yeah, <laughs> that's something I think that Tom Hardy would have fun with. Tom Hardy could do a little voice for the uh, dummy, <laughs> and then a separate voice for the uh, guy who controls <laughs> him. I don't know. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. Richard, do you have any uh, ideas? Um, false face would be awesome. False face. Sort yeah. of like your proto clay face. Like That's right. He was a guy that could basically just like literally change his face, but not like real. It wasn't a power. He was just great at disguises. Oh, Clock King. Clock King would be awesome. I think that would be a really fun one. Yeah. Um, yeah, Clock King, historically a green arrow villain in yeah. the comics, but then both the 60s show and the animated Batman threw Clock King in there as sort of a hmm. nemesis for Batman. He's a guy who's like, he, he, he plans his crimes so perfectly. To the minute. Like, to the, to like <laughs> you know, to the second, right? Yeah. So everything, you know, he steps right off the train right when the bus of school kids shows up so Batman can't chase him or whatever, like that sort of thing. Freddy the Fence? Who the hell is Freddy the Fence? There are some kind of one and done ones. I, I'm not sure I know him. I think I want to see King Tut. I, I, I know Jordan brought him up earlier. Yeah, but that yeah. idea of like a normal guy and then he gets hit on the head and then he thinks he's King Tut. But that feels like it could be really problematic. <laughs> Oh, sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. That, right. Have we evolved as a culture beyond <laughs> King Tut? Yeah. <laughs> I just feel like he starts putting on like an accent or something. Like it feels like. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, be, he, yeah. 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 Batman doesn't have to beat him up because he gets canceled. Uh, there you go. <laughs> that's right. It could also be the most like uh, sort of modern take on it because that's who he yeah. is on the inside. I think that you could potentially have. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think we're veering back into dangerous territory again. <laughs> yeah, maybe we just leave leave King Tut in the 60s. Yeah. Never mind. Another Joker movie, please. <laughs> yeah, let's do Joker again. <laughs> we're all safe. Hey, uh, Michael B. Jordan, you want to take a whack at Joker? <laughs> oh, I, I would be into that. Well, and the internet would yeah. love that, too. So I'd, I'd love that, yeah. The internet would have no issues with that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, all right, let's go to the next question. Uh, right. Uh, what's that sound? It, it must be morning. I hear the scream of a donkey. That's right. The next question comes from Braydon. So sorry, Braden. Uh, who asks, if you had to choose one Batman character, villain or hero, to have put have been put in the show, who would you choose? So sort of the reverse question. Yeah. So uh, you know, lots of villains either didn't exist at the time or they were too... Uh, they would have been too grim or whatever to put on right. a show like the 60s one. Who would you take and retroactively insert into that 60s world, make like a silly, campy version of them? Calendar Man. <laughs> Cal- Calendar yeah. Man would be great. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it would, have, would be really fun to let Burt Ward stretch a little bit and to do a Nightwing thing where Burt Ward trouble, goes off on his own, yeah. uh, uh, does becomes Nightwing and then Batman has a new ward. I don't know. I love that dynamic of like yeah. the Robins going off to be their own crime fighters. I don't know. And again, Burt Ward is such a like, you know, I mean, such that, a sappy it, milk toast in this. It's such like an easy fit to the to the sixties too, because you could very easily just like be like, okay, you're franchising, like be like, here's your, you've graduated, here's your diploma, here's your right. new uniform, head yeah. over to Bloodhaven. <laughs> Like, yeah, and you know, maybe they could have done a, you know, a, a, a disco thing with him where he, yeah. you know, hangs out at their version of Studio 54. Maybe it's a little, that's a little late, but uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe make, make, make him kind of like a modern uh, uh, swinging version of a superhero. Yeah, I love, I love that. Um, I think I, uh, I think like a version of like Firefly. But you have to, I mean, you can't be just a full on arsonist because that's not exactly the 60s sort of motif. But like, a, you know, the a Garfield Lynn's Firefly in the comics, you know, he starts as like a, a special events, like pyrotechnician, basically. Mm-hmm. So you, you could be like a guy that like uses like colorful fireworks or like special effects, almost like a Mysterio type uh, kind of thing, oh, yeah. I think. I think a Firefly would fit. That would be kind of interesting. You get some, like, things are about to heat up and, like, it sl- flicks it, a match. and Well, or we go, a lot we of go puns, full... A lot of puns. Yeah. We go full Condiment King. You could do that, too. Oh. <laughs> <I really like. laughs> 
Oh, that's just made for that show, though. Yeah, right? Har- I think some of those female villains would have been great, though. Like your Harley Quinns, your Poison Ivy. Yeah. like I, I think Ivy she- Ivy would have been awesome. She was. Did they I mean, never like, do a Poison Ivy in the '60s like, show? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. There was no Ivy ever on that show. I mean, she she must have been in the comics by then, but. Yeah, I yeah, she she's never she was never on that 60s show. She would have been a perfect fit. Yeah. Yeah, I would have loved that. That would have been awesome. Um, do you know what's funny? I completely glossed over Ivy because I think in my head I was like, well, they did Ivy. <laughs> you would think so, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Uma Thurman Poison Ivy does seem like it is right out of this show. I mean, yeah. it is like it is so it does seem like they've done it maybe because someone kind of did. It was just in, you know, 1999 right. or whenever. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah, that's true. I, well, she's just wrought with that, like the yeah. like repressed, the, like like sexually repressed writer who like yeah. wants to write about sexuality but can't for the yeah. thing that they're doing. Like that's yeah. what it feels yeah. like. There's something about an anatomically correct rubber suit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Amazing. Uh, all right, let's uh, jump into the next question. Let's do it. Uh, it comes from Mad Seb seventy seven, uh, right. who asks, "Let's say that Two Face was a villain on the show in the sixties." Uh, that the producers would have allowed it uh, if William Shatner wasn't available available to play him. Uh, which 1960s character uh, could have filled the role? Uh, I say Anthony Perkins from Psycho or Roddy McDowell from Planet of the Apes. Wow. Right. So Two-Face almost made an appearance on the show. There was an episode written by Harlan Ellison um, who wrote uh, City on the Edge of Forever oh, wow. from yeah. Star Trek. And it was going to introduce Two Face and Harvey Dent to the show, but it was deemed too dark. Really, too <laughs> gruesome. Was it Shatner that did it? No. Oh, the okay. reason Shatner's brought up in this question is that years later, that story was uh, put out both as a published comic and also as an animated film, for which Adam West and Burt Ward returned to do voices, and Shatner voiced Two Face. Oh, yeah. That came out kind of recently, didn't it? Yeah, I think maybe within the last five years, something like that. Yeah. So, it was kind of like Adam West's last performance, right? Yeah, it, I, I, think it, I think it might be. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, which 60s actor would you have wanted to see as Two-Face? Which is, I'm going to say the first thing that pops in my head is Burt Reynolds. <laughs> How old oh, would Burt yeah. Reynolds have been then? I don't know. He he might. I mean, he, when, when was my? When, he was in movie. He was in TV shows and stuff back then, wasn't he? I'm 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 not sure. I'm I'm a little hazy on the timeline. But Burt Reynolds, a young Burt Reynolds, just in general, I like that idea. Yeah. Oh yeah. He who's, he would, who's the he, guy? Yeah, he, who's the guy who played James Bond only once? Oh, George Lazenby. <laughs> Get George Lazenby. <laughs> That's yeah. You could do that. Yeah. yeah Burt oh Reynolds, God. Especially. Burt Reynolds, Burt, 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 yeah. Burt Reynolds would have been like thirty years old. That would have been perfect. Especially that picture of Burt Reynolds that you pulled up there. He's very young on he's, his Wikipedia. Yeah. He was very clean cut. He looks like a good Harvey Dent. A nice, you know, nice good guy. But also district re- attorney also refuses to paint his mu- like to cut off his mustache. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just one side has a mustache. Half- <laughs> I'll cut that's off half awesome. the mustache. Okay, that's incredible. Um. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I, I, I mean, they would never get him, but if they could, if they could have landed Richard Burton, <laughs> oh wow, be like throw him in there. I love that. I wow. would have. Yeah, it's amazing. That's Don Knotts was never on this show. I don't know that Two Face yeah. is the right character, but it seems like Don Knotts should have been in there at some point. Yeah, I mean, a Don Knotts Two Face. Like, oh, the acid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he's yeah. Yeah, Don Knotts would have been. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. I wonder who who he could have done. He would be a good ventriloquist. Oh, He'd be the guy yeah. that the, that oh, the dummy yeah. is puppeting around. Shit. He would be perfect. That would be good casting. Yeah. Yeah, I like that one. I prefer that. Uh, that's that's the answer. Who who should play Two Face? Don Knotts should have played <laughs> the ventriloquist. <laughs> oh my god, that's incredible. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. Uh, let's jump to the next question. Sure, yeah. yeah awesome. Uh, next question comes from Jake Murphy, who asks, uh, Jake Murphy, is he one of the police uh, The police from Gotham? Yeah, it's Chief O'Hara and then Sergeant Jake Murphy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, who asks, what creative team would you like to adapt the unproduced Batman versus Godzilla movie into an original graphic novel? Okay. So this is a thing that almost happened. They Whoa, almost, I had, yeah tell me about this i didn't know this was a thing they they almost legitimately like they were ironing out the rights they it, it was like 
like getting the ball rolling. They were going to make a Adam West Batman versus Godzilla movie. Is that like because they couldn't get Superman? Like, I I I think they just were like Batman's popular. Yeah, I think I this saw- is silly. We're gonna <laughs> put these two things together. I, think I, I can't remember precisely why it fell apart, but it it never ended up happening. I think I saw that poster on the I Am Legend uh, movie inside. The- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Batman v Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, that's crazy. Um, do you have you know in your head? a sort of comic book creative team that you you think could bring something like that to life. Yeah, I you know who I like a lot who I think has done some I don't know if he did Batman 66 comics. I know he did Wonder Woman uh 77 comics. Right. Uh Mark Andreco I think oh, uh, yeah. would be great for something like this. He's so funny. He, I think he knows Batman and he definitely like, you know, loves like, you know, camp and kitsch and stuff like that so yeah, yeah. yeah i think uh i think andreco would be a good choice for the writer who god who, who, do you, who draws this who do who does a good <laughs> monster i was sort of thinking of someone like uh, riley rosmo who's maybe most his most recent work was on martian manhunter with steve orlando oh, okay but riley rosmo's I didn't read that, got but orlando's great yeah uh, riley rosmo's got this sort of like it's almost terrifying, but it's also this very like cartoony, kind of kid like art. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it, I think it would be neat because it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily put it firmly as this is a monster thing or this is a kids thing. It sort of sits in that weird middle zone. I think he'd be a good artist for it. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I, Are I, you going to say Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale? I mean, that's yeah. my initial like, <laughs> yeah, super like introverted Batman versus Godzilla. Yeah, Godzilla looking in the mirrors like, why do I do this? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that would be great. Um, I also, I mean, it feels like it's it's ripe for like a Grant Morrison sort of concept because it's so high concept. Oh yeah, yeah. sure. I feel like. You could uh, like you find out that Godzilla is like from like another universe inside of like <laughs> yeah b- like Batman's cave or something like that. And right. He suddenly lets him out or something. Feels like that's a thing. Um, Probably he'd work with one of his uh, his stalwarts, you know, like a like a Frank Quitely or mm-hmm. something like that. And, I would love to see a Michael Cho as our, our, his art though. Like, yeah. I'm just pulling it up now. I mean, he's got that such a that classic sort of like 60s Batman vibe to his like work that yeah. I think it would be really great to see. Him. Yeah. I mean, if we were. If we were answering this question several years ago, I would say Darwin Cook, but mm. uh, you know, he's obviously passed away, so we can't do it. <laughs> but Michael Cho, I think, is a really, really strong successor to that sort of style. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. Um, awesome. Let's go to the next question. All right. Uh, let's leave Twitter and head on over to Instagram. Now we're going to Instagram. Take some questions and answer them. Yeah. It gets so much better as we go through <laughs> Hey, 170 some odd episodes yeah. in. We're great at this now. Uh, next question comes from, quite simply, just Ben. Okay, Ben. ben uh, who asks, what's your favorite Batman 66 comic? Have you read any of the crossovers with other 60s series? Have you read any of these ones, Jordan? They they basically, they started a full series of 60s Batman comics in the way that they did the Wonder Woman yeah. 77s. Uh, yeah, no, I haven't. I'm actually, I'm actually doing a little Google right now. Uh, no, that sounds, that sounds like a blast. I would love to. Uh, yeah, after watching this, I only like dear. While I was watching this, I, I kind of remembered that they had done this, and it was something I've been meaning to check out. One of my favorite things about those Batman sixty six comics is not only that they're drawing it in the style, or that you get the bam and the pow, and that the dialogue fits like the show. Yeah. it's that you get these narration boxes of the voiceover guy going like. <laughs> <laughs> previously yeah. will the caped crusader <laughs> escape like That's you get awesome. those they do all of these setups it's really like watching a storyboard for special guest will episode Farrell. for episodes that could have been yeah and actually the the thing that's neat about that show is they basically do what we were doing a couple of questions ago. They've introduced retroactively a bunch of more modern characters to the sixties oh, universe. Really? There's a Bane. Hmm. There's like a, like all sorts oh of characters that they've gone back and thrown what is in. Sixties Bane, like well, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what sixties Bane is like. That's really funny. Woodstock, baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but they Group did a couple trucking Batman. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a couple of miniseries though that they did. They did a crossover. Uh, Batman sixty six meets Green Hornet, 
done oh, neat. like a crossover would. And they did a Batman 66 meets Man from Uncle. Wow. <laughs> They're both pretty, wow. pretty cool. Um, I would say, I, I mean, I like the Green Hornet one. But that's, I think, such an easier mesh. The Man from Uncle one is neat because it leans more on the detective-y Batman thing because he's helping these super spies. Um, but I, I really like the Green Hornet one because you get the introduction of, like, Green Hornet was always a bit more pulpy than the 60s Batman was. So you get that sort of, like, it's almost like you're introducing 60s Batman to 40s Batman a little <laughs> bit. In that there's something oh, yeah. kind of interesting about that. Plus, you get Kato and Robin, and yeah, it's a ton of fun. That's That'd be awesome. great. Yeah, I, this, is probably, uh, this is probably a little more 70s and 60s, but uh, Batman meets Three's Company, I think, would be a lot of fun. <laughs> I think there's a, oh. yeah, both of them kind of have a, like, oh, a deception. There's a lot of deception in both of them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And so, I think the Batman, so help the, me God, 60s, we will get Don Knotts into this series. <laughs> yes, I know. Exactly. Yeah. The, the 60s was uh, kind of a farce in a lot of ways. So, yeah, yeah. I think that would work. Yeah, that's funny. Can you think of, like, a, a, a different crossover you would want them to do with something kind of 60s y? Oh, yeah. I, I think that, um, I mean, I would love to just see like Batman meets uh, like 60s 007. Sure. Of course. You get yeah. sort of oh, like yeah, two crime great. fighters, uh, uh, two detectives. Yeah. Um, oh, who was the, who's the 60s? Who's mostly the 60s? Uh, that 007? would have been Connery. Yeah, would it? Yeah. Oh my God. Could you imagine? Yeah. He fit in great with the Gotham Precinct yeah. too. So Alfred, another whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think uh, uh, Batman 66 meets Planet of the Apes. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Something goes horribly wrong with the atomic battery in the Batmobile, and he ends up in the Planet of the Apes future. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, Holy sure. Empire get your, States get your, uh, Yeah, get your hands off me, you damn dirty bat. Uh, yeah. you got, it's, it's right there. That's right, yeah. It's you want to hear it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. All right. Uh, let's go to the last question. Let's do it. Last question from Reddit. Okay. Where everyone's nice and no one's ever mean. That, that's very true. It's Reddit. At least for us. Yeah. People are nice to us that's on Reddit. True. We got lucky. Um, uh, the last question comes from Gromley473, who okay. asks, is it true that Robin was forced to take drugs to shrink his penis? <laughs> What? Yeah, okay. I remember this. This was like a this was like an a, an internet news story a couple months back when we were still doing fun shit on the internet. <laughs> it was a short story though. Well, well, no, right? Not yeah, sure. It was a wide <laughs> story. So, um, a quick correction: Robin wasn't forced to take <laughs> drugs to shrink his no. penis. <laughs> yeah. That, okay. So the, the the so didn't Bert Ward? He wrote a memoir or something like that. And one oh. of the things in the memoir was he claimed that his penis was too big for the costume, and they wanted to shrink what it a somehow. A, a, yeah. A, apparently, I know. apparently, according to him, uh, they were getting bad focus group feedback about how big his balls was, <laughs> and so. The they, the producers made him take the, these meds to quote unquote shrink his penis. Apparently, he took them for three days and then decided he didn't want to do it anymore. And then he, I don't, he said, "I found a way to keep the cape in front of it." Now so, I haven't forensically gone back yeah. and watched Batman episodes to see if he's holding the cape strategically, <laughs> but that's what he claimed. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's what he claimed. He also said he couldn't wear a cowl because his brain was too big too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> They had to put a mask on because he was too beautiful. Well, the the second half of that thing is that he claimed that he claimed that they had to stick towels in Adam West's trunks to give him a bulge. So it's <laughs> it feels a little petty. I don't know if it's true yeah. or not. But. You know, it's fun. He's an older guy. Let's let him take a victory lap uh, in, in, in his <laughs> twilight years. Yeah, yeah, buddy, you had a you had a huge hug. You way to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your favorite thing about your time on Batman? Well, let me tell you about my penis. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, that's incredible. Yeah, but yeah, uh, Batman wasn't take, making Robin do it. That's a weird story. Yeah, we're getting into Frank Miller territory there. <laughs> Batman's medicating his sidekicks. Jesus. 
Um, all right. Well, that's the end of the questions. All right. Um, so that means we're going into the next section. Oh, that's right. Uh, I'm ready for this. Probably something we should have warned Jordan about. But uh, so we're doing a thing called Dial Doc. Uh, do you want to explain to Jordan what sure. this is? Sure. There's no pressure to participate. No, but basically, the Dial Doc, this is based on Dial H for Hero, which was a classic DC Comics series where you get this magic rotary dial, and if you dial Hero, you become a never-before-seen hero or villain, as the case may be, with a wacky name and crazy powers. And basically, it used to be a way for fans to write in and say, I think this is a great idea. And you, they could just do it for a couple of pages, even though it wouldn't sustain a full comic. So every episode, we try and come up with Our two, own. two more dial uh well, dial age characters each one yeah. well yeah each week we each come up with one yeah um let's to kick it off uh we got we got uh, uh, a resident sent sent one in so okay why don't we read let's have those. that one yeah uh <laughs> so, so you got a batmobile right uh right yeah and and it's not going fast enough right i got a solution for you okay you put it in a block of ice is it the ice man custom right. the next question comes from the ice man oh, Customs. he's back that's right uh who asks, um, so he his dial doc entry for this week is a character named Earl Cababatusi, Kaba what is it? It's Earl Cababatusi. This is so inside. We have another person that writes into the show who goes by Earl Cababat. Oh. The Batusi is famously the the, the groovy Batman oh. dance. Oh, Okay, so, so this is Earl Cababatusi. This is uh, the most inside baseball thing geez. we've ever gotten. Uh, he is from the 31st century, and he once auditioned for the Legion of Superheroes, but he was rejected. Okay, uh, when he dances the Batusi, the people surrounding him get lulled in and dance with him. Okay, uh, studies have shown that he acquired his power from obsessively watching the 60s Batman TV show. Right. He is currently affiliated with the Legion of Substitute Heroes and was a good friend with Polar Boy before the latter was promoted to L-O-S-H. Legion of Superheroes. Legion of Superheroes. I mean, that's way more backstory than we ever give these characters. Have ever given them. I do like the idea of... Making uh, them like Batman, like 60s related. I do like the idea of it being uh, like a hypnotic Batusi power. That's pretty That's pretty good. That's fun. I, I like the idea of... Uh, I'm going to try to do something that's a little bit Batman 60s. Gonna, I'll try and think of something kind of kind of campy. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can go first. Okay. I like th my character's name is just quite simply Blackout. Okay. Uh, who has the ability to strategically find the light switch in any room and have it be the closest to him anytime he enters the room <laughs> so that he can then turn out the lights. Right. And, uh, you know, being able to do whatever he wants to. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Um, <laughs> mine is called, uh, mine is called Pete Discreet. Pete Discreet. And Pete Discreet basically has the, the power to take things that are otherwise sexy and make them suitable for family television. <laughs> uh, so, you know, if someone comes in and they got a low cut top, all of a sudden, that's a, that's a crew neck, baby. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's Pete Discreet. He could basically, uh, he could like PGify the real world. <laughs> that's really funny. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, did you want to take a crack at this? Oh, I mean, if, if I mean, just based off uh, based off what we've been talking about, it seems like uh, a penis shrinker would be helpful. So, <laughs> yeah, the uh, <laughs> yeah, does the it, dong, does... the dong, uh, the dong shortener. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Is there a fun? I'm, I'm trying to think if there's a. If what I want an alliteration in there that I can't think of, like a ding donger. Yeah the, like the yeah. yeah, the yeah, the schlong shortener, the yeah, schlong yeah. shortener. Yeah, that's the yeah. one. Yeah, there you go. If yeah. you have, yeah, if you had a superhero actor who, uh, you know, is upsetting people with their bulge, <laughs> call this guy. His real name is Richard for you. Short. Right, so yeah, <laughs> I like that. Very nice. That's really. That's fun. amazing. Oh my god. Um, Jordan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. For, yeah, thanks for, for having me. Here. This was fun, and yeah, and a fun, a fun excuse to watch this really, really fun movie. Yeah. Oh yes, everyone, please watch this movie. I I, I downloaded all of the original sixties show because I'm now I want to watch it all because it's it's too funny. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, Jordan, do you have stuff you want to plug? Where can people find you online? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I do a podcast called uh, Jordan Jesse Go. Uh, it's a weekly goof around. We got uh, we have cool comics as guests. Um, uh, yeah, it is at maximumfun.org or uh, wherever you get your podcasts. That's Jordan Jesse Go. Nice. 
And if you want to write a song about uh, Walton Goggins having a vodka, it's a good place to do so. <laughs> yes, we have a lot of very, uh, very intense, hard to explain running jokes. Uh, and if you <laughs> like the idea of people <laughs> writing songs about Walton Goggins, uh, uh, a vanity vodka brand, then Jordan Jesse Go is the show for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, your show Bubble is incredible too. I, I would say. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I have a. This was a. This is, it's a couple years old. I did a, a scripted podcast called Bubble. It's uh, like a comedy uh, sci-fi romp. Um, uh, TV, TV for your ears. We like to call it. It's uh, fully scripted, and um, yeah, that's at uh, maximumfun.org or wherever you get your podcasts. That's Bubble. Uh, we would love to hear the characters that you residents can come up with. All you have to do is reach out to us through our various social media platforms. But oh, don't forget that you can uh, uh, also uh, send us a question for next week's episode. That's right. Next week's episode, uh, we're participating in the JL May podcast crossover mm-hmm. again. This oh, year, right. the theme is Countdown to Infinite Crisis. We are going to be reading uh, the Blood of the Demon tie-in issues, uh, number six and seven. Mm-hmm. And then just more broadly, we're going to be talking about Day of Vengeance. What was happening to the world of magic? in the lead up to infinite crisis so yeah you can send those questions in very very cool so do that through our various social media platforms such as our facebook dr dc podcast our twitter at dr dc our instagram dr dc podcast email dr dc podcast at gmail.com of course we have a reddit r slash dr underscore dc and of course the doc phone is always open 208-917-3238 pick up that red phone in the corner of your room and give us a call (laughs) yep i'll go get them yeah (laughs) uh also uh not only can you talk to us online but you can also buy our merch (laughs) buy our merch our website drdcpodcast.com or dot ca uh and then we're always looking for more reviews uh 100 reviews we're at 75 we're at 75 75 right now if we get to 100 we're going to do a mini series about the lord of the rings called lord of the lord of the rings of course uh and then if we go on yes and uh (laughs) if you get to 200 Baby, we're, we're doing a full new podcast. Full new podcast. Supernatural hour, baby. Yeah, I, 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 we, we definitely want that. Uh, uh, we Pay for bots. Uh, uh, steal your friend's phones. Yep. Uh, uh, post on any yeah. platform that you choose. If, t- if you're Catwoman, pretend to be a Russian journalist and uh, give us a glowing review. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, pick up all of your bat phones and bat devices to be able to give us those reviews on those. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, we also have uh, more content that you can get every week uh, right. through our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Dr. DC. There are two levels. A $5 level is the Silver Age. $7 level is the Golden Age. But we do a full bonus episode every week. We uh, talk about all sorts of different geeky things. We also have uh, video episodes every week. There, right. You can vote on uh, what the themes for episodes are each month uh there's all sorts of fun stuff and we got cool stuff coming up because uh you know next month is fanagar so there's even more fun stuff coming that's right uh and if you if you're still uh, i want more content from us you can't get enough of us god you make me sick (laughs) (laughs) yeah you like our content don't you (laughs) little content bitch uh we've got a youtube series we do indeed it's not related to comic books it's called scaredy guys and we play video games that scare us and and you get to see us uh, uh literally be afraid by everything yeah we've done uh we've done a couple of little mini series on uh the last of us and then the remake of resident evil e- resident evil 2 and then tomorrow you're listening to this so tomorrow we're starting our brand new series uh, which is uh, the the dark something man of Medea? I think the dark pictures. Yeah, the man of Medan. Oh, Medan. Oh, yeah. Medea's man of the Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's cheer up. Yeah. So, uh, well, that so, was not an accent. I just oh, yeah, yeah. Jesus no, Christ. Nope. At wow. a point. Yeah, at a, Jesus. Uh, but please go check that out. Uh, you know, like the videos, uh, subscribe, and you can give us suggestions for other scary games you want us to play. Yeah, we'd love that. All right, that's it for this week. Adios. Ciao, ciao. Heroes, they always fight for what is right. Live with danger and adventure, they are men of might. This was a Brain Freeze podcast. <laughs>